uh, I've seen your, I've seen, no, it's not your film, it's a film that's a dramatization of your life, uh, Son of the South. And um, you know, it's, a, it's a very strong film, Bob, I've got to say. Um, you know, I've, I've been a, a, an activist uh, uh, for um, 50 years or so, but nobody has ever tried to lynch me. <laughs> uh, is that scene in the film uh, accurate? It is. Uh, unfortunately, yes. It, it was, uh, and it was very strange because it was my first uh, demonstration, and I kept thinking uh, they were overreacting because uh, it was my first outing, and uh, they they were so outraged that a white person would be doing that, uh, and I just thought I would have a very short uh, civil rights uh, career. But I'm still here, 82, 82 and, and uh, thriving. Very good, very good. Um, look, uh, I'll, 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 I'll return to the film later on. Um, I actually want to talk to, um, because, I mean, uh, the, the Green Left, I, I don't know um, if you've had a chance to look at our website at all, but we're a, a progressive radical newspaper or media project, as they call them these days. Um, and uh, our readers now, our viewers, um, uh, uh, would be very interested to know about the history of the, um, the uh, SNCC, the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, when was the SNCC, oh, of course, you're speaking to an Australian audience here. So um, yeah. when was the SNCC first formed? Uh, SNCC. Uh, we call it uh, SNCC, S-N-C-C, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and it was uh, formed in April of 1960. So it was uh, 40, 50, 60, 60 years ago, I believe, in, uh, in uh, the Deep South, and it was a response, it was uh, a coming together of the uh, young uh, Black uh, women and men who had made the uh, lunch counter sit-ins and the Freedom Rise. And they were convened by uh, Ms. Ella Baker at uh, Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina on April the 14th, 1960. And they formed a student coordinating committee, student nonviolent coordinating committee. And that was the beginning of SNCC. So, and so from the beginning, um, women played a, a leading and organizing role. Yes, uh, women have been uh, uh, crucial and key to both the foundation of the modern civil rights movement and uh, specifically of the formation of uh, my organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, because uh, th these were women who had uh, been active for many, many years. Uh, Ms. Ella Baker worked for the uh, NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People uh, for uh, many years. And uh, at the time she helped uh, uh, facilitate the organization of SNCC, she was the acting director of SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was Dr. King's uh, organization, formed out of the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, you were born in Alabama, and uh, you, you, you were born in Alabama, in, I believe, in 1938. And um, 39, you're making me a year older than I am. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, and your grandfather uh, was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, and your father was um, uh, had been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, uh, what was uh, what was the South like that you grew up in as a white person? Well, when I was growing up in the forties and the fifties, the South was uh, very strict. Uh, under a system of, of apartheid, uh, there was no uh, way that uh, black people and white people could uh, interact on a basis of equality. Um, 
and uh, growing up in lower Alabama with a father in the Ku Klux Klan, it was a, it was a struggle just, uh, in fact, it was a struggle within my own family because my mother's side of the family, her father was a, a Methodist minister and uh, her side of the family were from the uh, uh, indigenous people, the Native Americans. They were um, part of the Apalachicola band of Creek Indians. And uh, they were explicitly uh, anti-Ku Klux Klan. And my father and mother uh, met and, um, and got involved with each other when uh, they were uh, students at uh, um, uh, Bob Jones College, which became Bob Jones University. And maybe the Australians don't know that that was a, a kind of a evangelical Christian center of uh, Klan uh, uh, philosophy and uh, a uh, corruption of the Christian gospel. Yeah, um, I have heard of Bob Jones. Um, now, um... How did your father, your father broke from the Klan, didn't he? Yes, uh, my father uh, went to Europe in the middle 30s and he had some experiences that caused him to uh, begin to question his uh, Klan beliefs. And eventually he did um, manage to break from the Ku Klux Klan. And when he did, his mother and father disowned him and his brothers, his blood brothers, never spoke to him again in his entire life. Oh. And uh, I never understood how painful that could be to a young person to be disowned by your own parents. And uh, the only thing I can compare it to today is a, a young person that comes out as an LGBTQ person and they're disowned by their parents. So it's got to be one of the most devastating things that can happen to a human to be orphaned by your own parents. That, that's extraordinary. That, that's truly extraordinary. Um, and your father, your, your father was a Methodist minister, was he? <clears throat> yes, he, he, he became a Methodist minister. Uh, <clears throat> And he just, uh, he was a, a, a brilliant man and a mm. well-educated man, self-educated largely, but uh, mm. he uh, could not uh, uh, justify uh, the Klan beliefs that he was uh, learning from, from the Bible. Wow. And uh, it just didn't, uh, and then uh, delving into history, uh, we learned that, um, uh, even the slaveholders uh, had uh, an ambivalence about uh, converting the uh, enslaved people mm. because uh, if they can, uh, one of their uh, rationales for slavery was that they were going to uh, convert the heathens and bring them into uh, the, the Christian fold. But when they began to, uh, first of all, they, they, it was uh, illegal to teach an enslaved African to read or write. But when they began to uh, convert to be Christians, they were learning about the Bible. And what's a good part of the Bible? Freeing the slaves. Yeah. So the slave owners had to make a special Bible for the enslaved people. And they took out a lot of the Exodus story and a Moses story and and a huge amount of the uh, New Testament. They had to just remove it from the Bible because if the um, African-Americans read that, they'd say, well, Jesus and God are in favor of ending slavery. So we better be about the business of freeing ourselves. Um, you've been uh, you know, a progressive activist all your life. Um, what, what's the motivating principle of your politics? Is it Christianity, or are you a socialist, or, or what, what? Well, it was Christianity. Uh, we have uh, we have some uh, powerful influences in uh, the United States, and one is capitalism, and 
Mm-hmm. The other is Christianity. So I was, bo- I was uh, brought up under those systems. But once I began to question the uh, system of segregation and racism, it led me to que- question the, uh, the economic system. So certainly I, I became a socialist and an active socialist. Mm-hmm. And now um, we are confronted with uh, uh, a country that has 25 or 30% of the voting population that want to do away with democracy altogether. They want a form of authoritarian government. Mm-hmm. And, um, we are confronted with um, the situation that of if capitalism continues and imperialism the way it's gone for the last two two or three centuries, uh, we're going to uh, destroy the climate. We're going to kill the oceans, and we're going to end uh, the uh, ability of humans to live on the planet. So we have to uh, become socialists, and we have to say this uh, individualism and dog eat dog, grab and go capitalism has to end. Mm. If you were in Australia, you would be a supporter of the Green Left. (laughs) That's precisely what we say. Um, I just want to ask you about um, some of the individuals in the SNCC uh, who you encountered, um, like um, John Lewis. Um, In the film, it's uh, in the credits at the end, it says that John Lewis was a particular mentor for you. in Australia, we, we barely know of him. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one thing about um, US cultural imperialism. Uh, when you turn on the TV news in Australia, often um, they, they have a news feed from the United States coming directly into our TV news. So we get a lot of news about, say, the death of John Lewis a little while ago. Um, yes. Even, even though in Australia, he doesn't really count for very much. But... Uh, uh, your your culture and your news dominates us no matter what. Um, so what was John Lewis like? <clears throat> well, uh, John Lewis and I are both from Alabama. And uh, uh, John, uh, we even had the first two names. My, my full name is John Robert Zellner, and he was John Robert Lewis. And he grew up on a sharecropper's farm, a poor black sharecropper's farm. And while my father was a minister in the same area where John Lewis uh, grew up near Dothan and and, uh, Troy, it's in the southeastern corner of the state of Alabama. I worked on my uh, uncle's sharecropper farm. So um, one of the commonalities that John Lewis and I had was that uh, uh, black people often uh, were tenants on the on the uh, land and they didn't own land of their own so they had to uh, be sharecroppers and that was true of uh, a lot of um, African Americans and it was also true of a lot of white poor white people Mm. so we grew up together but John Lewis was one of the main um, early uh, young leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and he was very dedicated. He was a, a close uh, follower and disciple of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and I also got to know Dr. King uh, fairly well and was able to be in jail uh, with Dr. King in Georgia for a period of time. and. Um, What's John? And he had, uh, John, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King had decided to uh, mentor me, and he had men- as he had mentored uh, John Lewis. So John Lewis and I were close together. And I have never understood until the death of John Lewis how um, revered he was in the United States uh, because he had been active for so long and um, he had been brutally beaten, uh, threatened with death many, many times, and he just kept coming back and uh, full of love and forgiveness. And he was the epitome of nonviolent uh, direct action. John was uh, our leader. We were very proud of him. 
Right. Now, what about um, uh, Stokely Carmichael? Um, did you encounter him? Oh, yes. I, I knew Stokely very well also. Um, he was, uh, when he came down to the South, uh, he, had, he came from Howard University in Washington, D.C., so um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we were able to do, I was able to do, because I had been through uh, some of the fires of uh, racism in Mississippi and Alabama, was to, uh, to talk to Stokely about how to uh, uh, maneuver and be uh, uh, camouflaged and as invisible as possible in uh, the rural South traveling around the rural South and what to do and not to do to uh, come to the attention of the authorities, which always put you in danger. So uh, Stokely and I were very close. Um, he was uh, a project director in Mississippi during Mississippi Freedom Summer um, in Greenwood, Mississippi. That was the headquarters of our whole organization during the, that Freedom Summer. And he was a project director there. And when he was called uh, to other parts of the state, uh, I was uh, appointed temporary project director to carry on his work in uh, Greenwood, Mississippi. So we worked very closely together. But it sounds like you guys were operating semi-clandestinely, like you were operating as an underground resistance almost. Was there an element of that? Oh yes, we had to be. Uh, we had to have, and uh, we had to have very strong security uh, procedures because uh, our people could just be disappeared, and uh, so we had uh, we had a lot of technical support. So very early on, we had all of our cars uh, furnished not with cell phones but with CB radios. So we had uh, CB radio. Um, stations all over the South. So you, we could almost always be in, in touch with one of the uh, SNCC uh, base uh, radio stations. And um, we had uh, just routine uh, training in how to, how to move around with security. And uh, we would not uh, use the telephone if we were going from Atlanta to Jackson, Mississippi, we wouldn't say anything on the telephone about when we were leaving, when we were arriving, what route we were taking or anything, because we were under constant surveillance from the COINTEL Pro program of the federal government. We were, we were not only having to dodge the state governments that were police states in the South, but we had to dodge J. Edgar Hoover and COINTEL Pro because they were intent on destroying the civil rights movement. So we we had to avoid the state and the federal government. Is it true that, that um, uh, the FBI infiltrated the KKK so heavily that something like 25% of the leadership of the, of the Ku Klux Klan were actually FBI agents, which kind of raises the question in my mind as to whether uh, J. Edgar Hoover was running the KKK as a kind of death squad is, is that um, going too far in a, a sort of conspiracy theory of, of J. Edgar Hoover's behavior? Well, it's easy to have conspiracy theories about J. Edgar Hoover because he was definitely conspiring against uh, all of the leaders and all of the organizations of the civil rights movement. He tried to cause the death of uh, Martin Luther King uh, he did uh, cause and, and orchestrate the assassination of uh, Black Panther leaders like Fred Hampton in uh, Chicago. Um, so it's not too far-fetched, but um, many of us feel that their surveillance of the Ku Klux Klan was nothing like the surveillance of the civil rights organizations or the uh, Communist Party in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is estimated that a large uh, number of the rank and file uh, party, uh, Communist Party members, especially in the South, were FBI agents. And many times they were um, agent provocateurs. 
So we had them in all of our organizations. Mm. And we had to learn to be able to tell uh, who were the um, undercover agents. And usually we, we knew uh, long before they surfaced as agents, we knew um, more or less who were the uh, federal agents um, uh, in our midst. Wow. Um, now, I, I wanted to talk to you about, um, uh, about the political divergence between SNCC and Martin Luther King. Um, it, it, you were right in the middle of all of that. Um, what were the issues that arose and um, well, and what, what was the atmosphere inside SNCC when, when the, the political differences started to arise, uh, specifically around the question of nonviolence? Well, the, um, the early uh, period of SNCC, uh, I would say up until the time John Lewis was removed as uh, chairman of SNCC, the um, <clears throat> leadership in SNCC was basically uh, young black uh, women and men from the South who most of them had come through the, uh, up through the church. They had learned their leadership skills uh, through uh, participation in uh, church organizations. And they were, um, by and large, committed to not only the theory and practice of uh, nonviolence, but uh, as a way of life. Um, and um, John Lewis was one of those people. And in my early period, I was one of those people too. I, I accepted nonviolence as a uh, the uh, current, uh, uh, the, the manifestation of what I understood was the teachings of uh, the Christian church and especially Jesus. Um, so part of the uh, political break between SNCC and, uh, and Martin Luther King and his organization happened um, when SNCC uh, began to be more political um, and some people say more militant. I think we had been militant all along. There's a misunderstanding of the word militant now. They yeah. think that that's radical and violent, but you could be a, a, a nonviolent uh, militant person. Mm. Um, so part of the um, struggle with Dr. King was that um, many people th thought that uh, Martin Luther King was too moderate for the times. Mm. And especially when it came to more political questions like the Vietnam War. Uh, my organization took an early uh, stand against the uh, Vietnam War. And we lobbied and uh, cajoled and harassed uh, Dr. King for a number of years, uh, saying that uh, he needed to put his weight behind the, um, the anti-Vietnam War effort. And he fi finally decided in 1967 to uh, oppose the war. And that was exactly one year, he was killed exactly one year later, uh, he was assassinated. So those were some of the differences that we had. We also had uh, organizational differences because uh, of the dynamic leadership that we had in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, we grew very rapidly. Um, I was uh, on the original staff, and we started with 15 full-time staff people. And um, within a year or two, we had 150 or 200 full-time staff people, many of them well-educated, uh, experienced people. So very soon, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had the largest uh, civil rights staff in the South. And uh, many times we would start projects like in Albany, Georgia, or Selma, and we would work two or three years at the grassroots preparing people for voter registration. And uh, then the the local people would uh, would call Martin Luther King to come 
for a, a march or a demonstration and Dr. King would come in and then that would bring the press. That would bring a lot of attention. And then uh, SCLC and Dr. King would raise a lot of money. So part of the uh, uh, tension between the organizations was that uh, many times we would do the grassroots hard uh, organizing work a year after year and uh, Dr. King would come in and lead a march and everybody would say Dr. King's project in Birmingham or Selma or Albany, uh, it became his project rather than SNCC. So it was just organizational uh, competition. In general, what's, what's your thinking and feeling about the question of nonviolence? Well, there, there are practical uh, questions related to it and philosophical and moral and spiritual. Uh, the practical uh, side is that uh, we had a large uh, organization spread all over the South and um, we uh, had to make it known that we were not armed and we were not dangerous, we were nonviolent. Because if we had, um, if we had tried to have an armed struggle in uh, 1959 and 1960 in the Deep South, uh, we would just have been overcome because the um, um, the opposition had the weapons, they had the money, they had the political power, and um, they could wipe us out very quickly. So it was a practical question, and. In some ways, it was the only way that we could operate in uh, in those dangerous places because uh, the the press knew that we were not uh, we were not threatening people with violence. The violence was directed at us. We weren't directing violence at uh, at our opponents, and uh, that was one of the questions when the when the uh, Black Panthers came along and starting out in. Uh, Calif Northern California in the, at the California uh, capital. It's true, they had the right to, uh, to bear arms. They could come openly carrying rifles and, and bandoliers of bullets and so forth. But one of the things that did was it gave, uh, from then on, it gave every police person in the United States who wanted to kill them the right to kill them on site. And then they'd say, oh, shoot out between the police and the, uh, and the Black Panthers. Well, it must have been justified. The Black Panthers were probably shooting at the police. So um, that was one of the, uh, that was a practical consideration. Um, the long-term revolutionary consideration of nonviolence is that if you can make a nonviolent revolution, Hopefully you don't uh, create a whole group of uh, injured people who are uh, spoiling to get even and, and get revenge. So if you can make a friend out of an enemy, you increase your strength and you, uh, you take away uh, the ability of having a, a huge, uh, angry, uh, violent, bunch of people uh, to harass you from now on. You have more fights to, to do in the future. So that's uh, part of the um, maybe utopian idea of uh, nonviolent revolution. But you also have the practical one. Um, and some of these people need to be restrained. If they're not restrained, they're going to destroy our oceans. They're going to destroy our climate. And um, they're not going to give up on their own. They're not, most of them are not going to be convinced with the argument. So they need to be suppressed and, uh, and, and restrained, even captured. So how do you capture state power? How do you capture individual uh, violent groups? How do you capture them nonviolently? I don't know. In, in the film, um, SNCC is... Uh, represented as being uh, incredibly badly organized at the point when you joined it. Um, <laughs> just an, an empty office and, uh, and the telephone and 
your job is to take the messages um, without any training and no explanation. Um, so one question is, um, is that accurate? <laughs> was it really like that when you joined? And second question is, um, in the film, James Foreman um, just breezes in unannounced, um, is shown interviewing you with a tape recorder and then disappears and is not seen again. Now, my, my understanding is that James Foreman was a formidable force in SNCC and that he went on to, I think he, I think he joined the Black Panthers and oh, one of those other revolutionary groups in Detroit or somewhere, the, uh, you know, the um, revolutionary black workers or something. Black workers, uh, uh, black workers organizing committee. I'm not sure, but yes, he, he went on to uh, Detroit and uh, he also wrote, uh, wrote books, uh, the making of black revolutionaries. Um, yeah, Jim Foreman was. Uh, <clears throat> you could uh, you could make a whole movie of Jim Foreman, and um, in the movie he's played by his son oh. uh, Shaka. The person who played him uh, looks like him, sounds like him, uh, <laughs> and is his son. So Shaka know, knew James Foreman very well. But James Foreman was an organizational genius. He's the one who came in. And the reason it was so uh, feared to be so unorganized was that it was true. Uh, all of SNCC was in one little briefcase because up to that time, you see, it had been a coordinating committee. And we did have a little newsletter and we had uh, uh, a central committee and so forth, but uh, there was no staff. Uh, there had been one person in the, uh, uh, in the SNCC office. And, um, and that was mainly just to answer the telephone and, and just try to keep people together. But uh, Jim Foreman was, um, was recruited, strongly recruited uh, by uh, Ms. Ella Baker and other uh, the uh, civil rights elders uh, who knew that he was uh, he was a, 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 war, a military veteran. He was uh, well educated and he had been very involved um, in several uh, uh, campaigns. And he was a proven uh, administrator and organizer. And when he came to SNCC, uh, he came as the executive director, just as the SNCC, as the staff was formed. So in that fall of 1961, which the movie covers, the staff was just coming together. And the first meeting that we had in Macomb, Mississippi, that was the first uh, staff meeting that we ever had. That was the first time the staff ever really got together. Wow. The coordinating committee had gotten together periodically, regularly over the uh, year, the year or so um, before the staff was formed. But that was the first staff meeting, and within twelve months, we went from a one-room office to a ten thousand square foot uh, building that had a full printing press. We had a fleet of cars called the uh, Sojourner Motor Fleet with 150 automobiles. We had our own uh, uh, repair shop uh, to uh, repair the cars. We had uh, technicians to uh, equip all the cars with uh, citizens band radios. Uh, we had uh, then a, a newspaper, uh, the student voice. Uh, all of the uh, staff were equipped with cameras. We were trained to, as journalists to uh, write the stories for the uh, for the southern for the student voice, and also to be able to have a communications department. And that Julian Bond became the uh, head of the um, communications department, and that was extremely important for the building of SNCC because. If you didn't, uh, you could have all kinds of things happening and horrible massacres. If it wasn't covered with the press, it was like they, it didn't happen. So the, the, all of those things came together and it was 
James Foreman that pulled it all together and, and kept it operating and raised uh, uh, with the first year's budget of the SNCC was $5,000 probably. Uh, the next year it was uh, maybe a uh, million dollars. So it was just, and, and because the time was so, uh, everybody was wanted to do something about this horrible situation in the South and in the United States that uh, people were coming from all over. And soon we had support groups in Boston, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco. We formed Friends of SNCC groups. We also had a singing group that was very good and would go to colleges and universities and, and uh, auditoriums and, and have audiences of thousands of people. And that was both a fundraising outfit and a recruiting outfit because after the concert, uh, young people would come up and say, how can I get, how can I come south and, uh, and work with SNCC? So they recruited people and raised money. It was an incredible organizing feat and it was mostly the re uh, results of having uh, Jim Foreman as our executive director. But was the Communist Party involved at all? I mean, it, I'm, I'm used to, I mean, I'm a member of the Socialist Alliance. I'm used to the party for being a big part of organizing movements. You know, I and mean, um, so well, I, I know that the, um, uh, the, so, the American Socialist Workers Party um, did not participate in the Freedom Summer. Uh, their, their youth movement did not, did not participate in that. But uh, was the Communist Party very prominent? Was it, uh, you know, was it involved? Not, uh, no, it wasn't, it wasn't prominent uh, publicly, mm -hmm. but a, a lot of the people that had been, had come up through the uh, American Communist Party, uh, CPUSA, yeah. uh, were involved. And a lot of the elders that had uh, <clears throat> prepared the ground for the civil rights movement uh, were uh, trained and politicized uh, in the uh, in the Communist Party, mm. but uh, in the United States uh, there was such a hysteria because of the McCarthy period, mm. um, just being accused of being a communist, and then we had the uh, unfortunate uh, situation in the United States is that a lot of socialists and others who were on the left uh, felt a need to uh, separate themselves and from the, from the communists. So there was a lot of red baiting inside of all of the uh, civil rights organizations. Yeah. And uh, I very early on was on the uh, National Executive Committee of SDS, the Students for Democratic Society in uh, the United States, which was mainly um, inspired by SNCC and Tom Hayden and Al Haber and Bob Ross and a lot of the uh, original founders of SDS were first uh, SNCC activists. They were active in the civil rights movement or in the North in support of what we were doing. So there was a lot of, uh, when we had the lunch counter sit-ins, they would uh, have sympathy pickets uh, at Woolworths and uh, those companies, they would, uh, they would picket them in the North. So, but inside of SDS, there was a huge debate about whether or not they would uh, permit communist party members to participate. Wow. And in the South, uh, everybody wanted to uh, be sure that they didn't have any card carrying communists in their organizations. So, all of the, um, a lot of the left organizations, progressive organizations uh, succumbed to the red baiting. But um, Ann Braden and um, Ella Baker and um, uh, Fred Shuttlesworth, a lot of the older civil rights leaders said, we are, if you get involved in trying to find out who's a communist and who's not, you're not going to be able to do your work. And so, Nick, we, we adopted the policy that 
if you want to work with SNCC in Mississippi and Alabama, where they're going to kill you for uh, registering people to vote, we don't care if you're a communist or whatever, come and join us. <laughs> so uh, we, we did not, uh, we, we had an open policy. We said we're not going to uh, question somebody's uh, 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 political affiliations or thoughts. And when we started the Grow Project later on, uh, specifically to organize poor and working class white Southerners, um, we, we said uh, we, in that work that we, we weren't interested if you were, uh, had been a Klansman or a communist or whatever, if you want to work together, uh, then uh, you're welcome to come and work with us. So we did. We just had an open door policy uh, as far as uh, the red baiting was concerned. If you want to work with SNCC, uh, come work with SNCC. We'll take everybody. In the late 60s, around 1967, uh, to some extent, because of the um, internal um, infiltration by the COINTEL Pro program, mm -hmm. um, there, there became a, a big struggle in uh, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, between uh, narrow nationalism and revolutionary nationalism. And uh, SNCC uh, had a, 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 they were debating about whether or not to have an all black organization. They wanted to, um, they wanted to begin to organize more in the North, in uh, Chicago and so forth. And uh, some of the narrow nationalists were arguing that if we're going to organize in the North, uh, we, we can't have any white people in the organization. We've got to be an all black organization. So that was the struggle that we had um, in the late sixties. And that's when we started the GROW project, which is called Grassroots Organizing Work. And one of the things that uh, the uh, veterans in SNCC were saying is that the white people need to do anti-racism work and you need to go organize with white people. So that was the commission that we had from SNCC to form a project to go and work with poor and working class white Southerners who up to that point had only been organized by the Ku Klux Klan or the uh, Nazi party, uh, the right wingers. And nobody had ever tried to um, have a, a long-term, well-financed, well-planned um, organizing project. So that's what um, my wife, Dorothy and I undertook to do that. And we made a proposal called the GROW project, grassroots organizing work. And to make it clear to the um, poor white and working class white people who had been in the Ku Klux Klan and the white citizens councils, we, we also called it get rid of Wallace, George Wallace, <laughs> who was the governor of my state of Alabama. So that's how I got cross purposes of George Wallace. So that was the... Um, campaign that we launched and it, the GROW project lasted longer than SNCC did. The GROW project went on for about 12 years. And by the end of 1960s, um, SNCC was pretty much uh, out of the picture because it uh, faded away pretty soon after it became all black. Yeah, and there was a lot of uh, organizing on the new left of a new communist party. So we had a rise of a revolutionary union, uh, October League, all kinds of uh, new left uh, organizations uh, began to organize uh, various left-wing parties. And that went on for 12 or 15 years, I guess. And I was all, very much involved in all of that. And that, struggle of the new left against the old left uh, played itself out all across the South uh, through a, a lots of different organizations. Have any of those organizations survived to, to today? Um, 
Well, the there are not very many that are functioning now as organizations. Include SNCC is not functioning as an organization anymore. The Black Panthers, not really. Um, uh, Progressive Labor, uh, Revolutionary Union, very few of them are functioning now. Mm. In fact, um, the um, the a banner holder of all socialist thought is uh, Bernie Sanders. So we have a democratic socialist uh, movement. And a lot of those people that were in these uh, new communist organizations or uh, the new left organizations um, are supporting in one way or another uh, Bernie Sanders or the Green Party or the Working Families Parties and so forth. So they, they do have some uh, more or less mainstream parties that came out of that, but uh, none of them that were on the uh, real leftists are, are still functioning. Right, right. Um, okay, which brings me to contemporary politics. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> uh, the, the United States has been on a roller coaster ride <clears throat> over the last few years. Um, it appears to me, looking from the outside, that um, I don't want to. I, I don't want to sound too dramatic about this, but it really does sound. It really does look as though the United States um, is being primed for um, civil war. Um, Trump and the re, the the remaining Trumpistas. Um, very clearly, uh, oh, well, that, that whole wing of the Republican Party, um, it's a white supremacist movement. It's transparent. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's not hardly a wing anymore. It is the Republican Party. Now, the Republican Party has completely capitulated to uh, this. Uh, and that's a really strange thing. How can so many smart people be uh, bamboozled uh, by this uh, charlatan. I mean, he's not even, he's not even smart. Uh, so, so what's your reading of, of American politics? What are, what are the prospects for the future as, as you see them? <clears throat> well, the prospects for this future are uh, bright, I think, uh, in, uh, in a contradictory way. Uh, for one reason is that um, the assault on the House of Representatives and the Senate on January the 6th uh, showed uh, a large uh, portion of our population how fragile uh, democracy is. And also they realized that it was precious. So we probably have a lot of people now who are willing to take action and spend money and time in trying to restore our democracy. Um, but at the same time, we have um, the right wing forces, uh, not all of which are fascists. Um, they seem to be uh, concentrating their uh, poison. Uh, as examples of, of removing Liz Cheney from uh, the Republican leadership. Uh, this is a person with a tremendously conservative voting record, and uh, they're replacing Liz Cheney with a person with a much more liberal voting record. And the only difference is that Liz, Liz Cheney said, uh, Donald Trump is not and should not be the leader of the uh, Republican Party. He's not a, he's not even a conservative. And this other person from New York, it has a more liberal uh, voting. And the basic difference between the two of them is that uh, the one that's just been elected to the position that Liz Cheney had is a vocal, enthusiastic uh, cheerleader and supporter of Donald Trump. So here's a party that by now, uh, should they should have taken the opportunity of the January 6th assault on the government as a way to say, okay, Let's uh, reverse course here. But not only have they not reversed course, they are doubling down now. 
and they're saying that we only want people in our party who are dedicated, action-minded fascists who want authoritarian government, and uh, that's what they're going for. And um, so I think that um, the damage that they're doing to themselves, uh, many Democrats and moderates in the middle of the road people are saying, you know, don't uh, don't disturb them while they're ripping themselves up. But it, it does seem that they're doing that. Mm. And uh, it's one of the things that we count on. But the other thing that looks hopeful is because of the George Floyd case and all of the um, publicity around the police uh, brutality against black people, uh, there's a huge uh, turnout now. A multitude of people are turning out for um, reforming police culture, uh, making some basic changes there. Um, a lot of support for uh, putting money into um, social services that have been starved now for years and years. So uh, as far as the moderate uh, progressive agenda, it looks like it's going ahead. And I think what the, what the socialist uh, agenda is to right now uh, work within that electoral system uh, while we're uh, talking about our principles and trying to educate people on what uh, democratic socialism is. Because we all already have uh, large uh, pieces of it as part of our uh, national uh, government. Mm. And uh, we need to be able to, uh, de to develop the power so that we can stop the, uh, the use of fossil fuels. And that, that means a revolutionary change. But uh, the green forces have uh, all the good arguments, and that is that solar power and uh, all of these other kinds of power are now uh, not only competitive, they're cheaper than the use of fossil fuels. And we have to stop the use of fossil fuels if we expect to have any future on this planet. So a lot of people are finally going to come to the conclusion that we're going to have to make some kind of radical change in our economic system. And because of Bernie Sanders, we can now publicly talk about socialist uh, alternatives. Whereas before, socialism was about as anathema as communism. And of course, the right wing is still trying to bamboozle people to say any kind of socialism is is godless communism. And it, well, anyway, we're, uh, we're in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we, uh, my wife, Pamela and I are very uh, uh, optimistic about our work with young people because we're working with large numbers of um, high school students through Shirts Across America this is one of the groups that's working with the high school students and they're developing a group. What's that it's called Shirts, Shirts Across America, S-A-A. -A. And that was organized um, by um, people in Seattle, Washington, who um, got high school students together back uh, after Hurricane Katrina destroyed New Orleans to have them come down to New Orleans and help rebuild uh, the homes of African-Americans in the Ninth Ward. And that became a leadership training program. And now because of COVID, the last uh, year, they haven't been able to come down to New Orleans. So they've developed a curriculum for uh, high school students. And now it's being uh, uh, promoted in the uh, Catholic schools all over the northeast, uh, northwest, mm -hmm. and uh, that we also work with another group uh, called Action Academy for college students, the kind of um, organizing that we did during SNCC. Mm -hmm. So we're getting large numbers of college students trained in organizing techniques to address uh, the climate uh, organizing. And uh, the uh, movie that we did, Son of the South, is uh, being used in a lot of these um, uh, 
organizations now because we have a very good uh, leading character, leading actor, Lucas Till. Mm. Uh, I don't know if he's very well known in Australia, but uh, when we told our granddaughter in New Zealand, she was a uh, uh, 11 years old, I think. And she said, well, who's going to play uh, Papa Bob? And we said, uh, an actor named Lucas Till. And she said, oh, he's my crush. So even the little children in New Zealand know Lucas Till. And he's been transformed by being in the movie, as a lot of the other performers are. And they're all becoming part of this educational program that we're doing nationwide in the United States and hopefully Canada, and maybe we'll come to Australia and talk to our mates down there. Oh, thank you very much, comrade. It's wonderful talking right. to you. <laughs>